Here we go! Come on! As a six or seven year old, Game Boys blew my socks off. Marketing genius released in all shapes and colors that parents would buy their kids and send them off to school as walking advertisements. Absolutely mesmerizing to other children. Time marched forward and we got sideways Game Boys, backlit Game Boys, Game Boys with two screens, and 3D Game Boys. Nintendo had had more than a dozen iterations of their handhelds, and with each big hardware leap, they invested in backwards compatibility, and allowed the previous gen's games render as playable, at least for the first model. Oh. On the console side of things, it's a little bit more locked down. We'll be covering both the console space and handheld space in this video, skipping over some of the smaller stuff as the scope of games and first party accessories within the Nintendo camp is already large enough. If you just need an answer to a question about backwards compatibility, please reference the Google Sheets link in the description and hopefully you can find your answer there. This spreadsheet is still actively being worked on and I've used all the feedback I got in my PlayStation compatibility video on it, so hopefully it will be as close to as 100% accurate someday. I realize that this is a large topic and I'm bound to get something wrong, so please correct me in the comments and I will do my best to update the spreadsheet accordingly as that should be the source of truth. One last addendum, the video and the chart will not reflect virtual console, this is only physical media and physical accessories. Also, we're going to do this video as if Miyamoto was watching right over our shoulders. So I have not included facts like you can play GameCube discs on the Wii U if it's homebrewed. Same thing goes for the Wii and all the crazy stuff you can do with it with an SD card. We'll be jumping from console to handheld, kind of in a loose timeline sort of structure. So with that out of the way, let's start with the original. Nintendo Entertainment System or Famicom as it was known in Japan. There were several variants of the NES released all throughout different regions of the world. You had the original gray and red Famicom released in Japan and the VCR-like Nintendo Entertainment System released in North America and PAL regions. Unfortunately, all of these were region locked, so you could only play that region's games on that region's console. Controllers are a tad different. You can actually use a PAL NES controller on a North American NES, but not the other way around. As for the Famicom, it came bundled with two controllers that were actually hardwired to the console itself, being unremovable. The Famicom cartridges also had a completely different design, being smaller, more colorful, and Curvier. In 1993, Nintendo released the new style NES, or Top Loader NES, as it was known in North America and PAL regions, and the new Famicom, as it was known in Japan. This redesign was more compact and cost reduced. It also did away with the security chip on the PAL and North American versions, so you could actually play those region's games on the other region's console. This top loader variant also came with a new dogbone style controller that utilized the same controller port as the originals, meaning old controllers were compatible as well as all accessories that used those ports. Another thing to note is that the top loader's cartridge port, it actually improved the reliability of games loading compared to the toaster-like loading option of the original NES. The top loader did use cheaper parts, and one drawback of using one was the video quality. It was reported to be lesser than that of the original. Dinosaur, Let's jump forward to 1990 with the release of the Super Nintendo and Super Famicom. Across all regions, these use different controller ports, different cartridge ports, so you're not going to be able to use anything from the NES on the SNES, or vice versa. As far as region lock stuff go on the controller front, you can use any SNES controller on any Super Famicom, vice versa. Total freedom there. Games are region locked, but this time there is no difference in the pins of a Super Famicom game versus a North American game. So as long as you can get the game physically in your console, you're good. I know Miyamoto probably wouldn't want us to do this, but yes, you can take the screws off of your North American SNES, take off that top cover of plastic and put in Super Famicom games and they will play just fine. There's also a cleaner option where you can remove these two pieces of plastic inside the SNES, like these two, you remove like these two tonsils and, but it takes a Dremel and a screwdriver and some pliers. There's also a method where you swap the cartridge housings, which have, whatever you want to do, or you just get a f emulator like everybody. Else. Nintendo also released an accessory called the Super Game Boy, which allows you to play Game Boy and Game Boy Color games on your SNES. Although 
though not every Game Boy Color game, only Game Boy Color games that allowed for dual mode. What is dual mode? Dual mode is something that some Game Boy Color games had, like Pokemon Yellow, which allowed for them to be played on the original Game Boy, as well as Game Boy Color. One mode being a color mode for the Game Boy Color, the other being the black and white mode or black and green mode, whatever, for the original Game Boy. There was also a second iteration of the Super Game Boy called the Super Game Boy 2, which in terms of compatibility, it allowed for the use of a link cable. So yes, now you could use your Pokemon Yellow card and trade Pokemon from your SNES with somebody else's Game Boy or just trade with yourself from your own Game Boy. Before we get into the Game Boy realm, to wrap up the Super Nintendo, there was a second generation of Super Nintendo release called the New Style SNES or Super Famicom Jr. in Japan. Everything from the previous model carried over, apart from a few exceptions, you could no longer do the housing top removal or tab removal to play the other region's games. There was also a peripheral for the original Super Famicom in Japan called the Satellaview. This allowed players to download games, magazines, and other media through satellite broadcasts provided by the Japanese company ST Giga. This was actually fairly popular in Japan, it was one of the few peripherals that was not compatible with the new Super Famicom Jr. So we've already dipped our toes, let's talk about Game Boys. Now there's a lot of them, and we're gonna start with the first four released. The original Game Boy, Game Boy Pocket, Game Boy Light, and Game Boy Color, which we already touched on a little bit. The big takeaway from this Game Boy generation is that there are certain Game Boy Color games that can only be played on Game Boy Color if specially marked. Otherwise, they should be compatible with the Dot Matrix Game Boys as well. To get this out of the way, Game Boy games are not region locked. There are exceptions when it comes to link cables and communicating between the two. For instance, a Japanese Pokemon Red can't communicate with a link cable to an NTSC Pokemon Blue. Games can only talk to other games in their same region. Speaking of link cables, there's a lot of them, so we're gonna go over the first two generations of link cables that go up to the Game Boy Color. So Gen 1 link cable for the original Game Boy. Model number was DMG04, you could only use it between two big original Game Boys. There was an adapter that allowed for four players with this cable called the DMG07, only worked with very few games. Next came the Gen 2 link cable, this was the MGB008. This used a smaller connector and was for the Game Boy Pocket, Game Boy Light, which was only released in Japan, and the Game Boy Color. There were adapters released that made the big one small and the small one big. Big being original Game Boy, small being pocket, light, color. So whichever generation of cable you have, you could get an adapter that would make it compatible with the other generation of Game Boy. In addition, there was another cable release called the MGB-010. This had a Gen 2 connector on one end and then split into a Gen 2 and Gen 1 connector. This one probably being the best bang for your buck in terms of compatibility. Looking at how many different link cables there are, it does make me glad that everything is done wirelessly nowadays. But there was a certain satisfaction that you got from using the link cable. Not in a sexual sort of way, that's for sure. But it was a lot more intimate when your Game Boy, aka your pride and joy, was plugging stuff into your friend's Game Boy, his pride and joy, or her pride and joy. Hey, the N64! Unfortunately, there's really not too much to say as far as backwards compatibility goes. If you were a kid back in the 90s and you had your console sitting in front of you, it was actually very obvious that the NES cartridge or the SNES cartridge would not fit into the N64. Additionally, there was never an official device release that let you play your Game Boy games on your N64 like there was for the SNES. Well, that's not entirely true. Let's put an asterisk on that for now. There was a device called the Wide Boy 64 that did this, but it was only ever released to the press and developers. You might already know what I'm leading up to, and that is the N64 Transfer Pack. This guy let you extract data from your Game Boy cartridge to a compatible N64 game. These came bundled with Pokemon Stadium and allowed the player to transfer their hard-earned and hard-trained Pokemon from their Game Boy into the N64 cart. There was an option in Pokemon Stadium called GB Tower Mode which allowed you to play Pokemon Red, Blue, or Yellow on your N64. Although the video quality wasn't great and these were the only three games the transfer pack allowed you to fully play like this. Not to say that other games weren't compatible and couldn't do something with the transfer pack in a GBA game. This only worked for 19 and 64 games, and as you can see in the video, I'm using it for uh, Mario Tennis Game Boy to Mario Tennis N64. You can get some extra characters, and this is actually the reason that I bought the transfer pack. So I'm definitely in the minority, as everyone I knew as a kid exclusively used this for the Pokemon Stadium games. For real, Mario Tennis is good. 
let's talk about the GameCube. Did anyone else besides me get a GameCube just to play Sonic Adventure 2 Battle? Oh, everybody bought it for Melee. I really just love that intro. It's just as good today as it was 20 whatever years ago. Of course the GameCube wasn't compatible with any of the past console cartridges. It was the first Nintendo console to use CDs, but not traditional CDs, it used these Bagel Bite CDs. Something else that's pretty cool is the GameCube and N64, and actually the SNES as well, they all use the same AV port. So if you bring your GameCube over to your friend's house and you forget the AV cord, if your friend has an SNES or an N64, you can actually use the display cord from that on your GameCube. But if you uh, forget the power cord, you guys are probably just going to have to play outside. Nintendo decided to bring back the big backwards compatibility Game Boy accessory for the GameCube, hearkening back to the SNES's Super Game Boy, the Game Boy Player was released released, only a few months after the Game Boy Advance came out. This plugged in right in the bottom of the GameCube and allowed you to play Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance games on the big screen. This did require a Game Boy Player boot up disc, you could use a GameCube controller to play, or a GameCube to Game Boy Advance link cable which worked for the Game Boy Advance and Game Boy Advance SP. Funny enough, even those big Game Boy cartridge games that had the gyroscope in them, like Kirby Tilt and Tumble, were compatible with the GameCube player. It works exactly how you think it works. You just pick up the entire GameCube and tilt it around like a king. The Game Boy player also included a third gen link cable port at the front. So much like the Super Game Boy 2, you can trade Pokemon with yourself. I already touched on this cable a little bit, but the GameCube to Game Boy link cable that plugs into the controller port interfaced with dozens of GameCube and Game Boy games in a lot of unique ways. For instance, you can export and import Chow to and from the Sonic Adventure remakes into Advance 1, Advance 2, and Sonic Pinball Party. Kind of similar to what you could do on the Dreamcast with the VMUs. Tears for souvenirs are all you Likely the most ambitious example of this comes in the form of Zelda Four Swords Adventures. This game utilized the GBA and the link cable by transitioning your character from the TV screen into your Game Boy screen when you would enter a small room. Now this game supported four players, and this is where it gets kind of wacky. To play this game with four players, you need a GameCube, the GameCube disc, four GameCube to Game Boy Advance link cables, four Game Boy Advances to connect them to, and even if you have all of that, you still need three friends. So it's easy to see why people ask for a Four Swords Adventure remake nowadays on the Switch, because nobody besides Miyamoto would have all that. And even if Miyamoto doesn't have three friends, he has the money to buy three friends. The Game Boy Advance. Wow, two out of three of these models are really good. The OG Game Boy Advance is compatible with original Game Boy games, Game Boy Color games, and that GameCube adapter we just talked about. It does utilize a new link cable that is not backwards compatible, nor is it compatible with any of the old link cables. They do allow for the ability to daisy chain into one another so you can have more than just two players. Same with the Game Boy SP, we basically got a backlit screen and a rechargeable battery. Hands down best Game Boy, right? You are absolutely right because the successor was the Game Boy Micro. Aptly named, this is the smallest Game Boy. But the price it paid to be so small, it's too great for some, including myself. The Micro can only play Game Boy Advance games. It is not compatible with the third gen normal Game Boy Advance link cable, although they did make an adapter. And it's completely incompatible with the GameCube link cable. The weirdest part is the MSRP for the Game Boy Micro. It had the same introductory price as the Game Boy Advance and SP at 99 Freedom Eagles. It felt kind of like a beta test market product, but then again, it had its own accessories, it had its own link cable and link cable port. Nintendo made a new generation of link cable just for this device. Well, you got me. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. I know I'm being harsh on the Game Boy Micro, and by all accounts, this video is for backwards compatibility. I know we've been kind of going outside of that mold here and there. And to be fair, Nintendo pulled an apple. They took the headphone jack out of the Game Boy SP and they brought it back in the Micro. Also of which there is an adapter for the Game Boy SP to get a headphone jack. The Micro also had a brighter screen. Back in 2005, one of my buddies got a Micro for his birthday and for the time, relative to the time, the size of it was really cool to play. It, I mean, it slipped right in your pocket. You barely noticed it back then. And hey, those older Game Boy Color Game Boy games, they were on the way out. But the two unforgivable sins for me are the link cable stuff and the Nintendo DS was already out for $50 more. And not to jump too far ahead, but the Nintendo DS 
could play Game Boy Advance games. So it's just funny to me that Nintendo ended the great name of the Game Boy on such a bum note with the Micro. But hey, you don't have to take it from me. They did pretty well in the years to come. We're in the money. We're in the money. We've got a lot of what it takes to get along. We're in the money. The DS line did pretty well in terms of sales, and acted as a stepping stone into what some consider to be the Nintendo Renaissance era. But apart from the dual screens, the touchscreen stylus, and those little cartridges, what had changed since the Game Boy? Did anything roll over? Was anything kept? Well, if you owned a Game Boy SP, you'll be happy to hear that the DS uses the same AC adapter. It had a cartridge port at the bottom, which was only compatible with Game Boy Advance games. You could actually utilize this port as a one-way transfer of Pokemon from a Game Boy Pokemon game like Pokemon Emerald into a DS Pokemon game like Pokemon Diamond. This was likely done because no model in the DS line is compatible with the Game Boy Link cables. All communication between multiple DS systems was done wirelessly now. The DS Lite came out a couple years later, it got a new AC adapter, it was still compatible with Game Boy Advance games, although they added this weird butt plug at the bottom, foreshadowing the inevitable end of the Game Boy Advance compatibility with the DSi and DSi XL, no doubt taking influence from a certain device released around that time. Oddly enough, there were six DSi-only game cards released. All of them make use of the new cameras on the system, but yeah, I have not heard of any of these games. The DSi also introduced yet another AC adapter, although this would be the final AC adapter in the DS line. So yes, your DSi charger is going to work on your 3DS, your new 3DS, the Excel versions of those, you're set. Before we get to the 3DS, let's talk about a little home console that came out around that time. The Wii is really unique because it's the only Nintendo home console that, up to this point, is compatible with the previous gen's physical media, that being GameCube discs, GameCube controllers, and anything that would stick in the GameCube memory card ports, even the Mario Party 7 microphone. Why was the cable on this so long? Note that any Wii model that came out in 2011 and afterwards did not have this GameCube backwards compatibility. This was called the Wii Family Edition. The easiest way to tell being the orientation of the Wii logo on the front of the console. The vertically orientated ones will be compatible with GameCube stuff and the horizontally orientated ones will not be compatible. This is what it looked like if you tore off the top panel of the Family Edition. There were some Wii games that also used those ports and those were incompatible with the Family Edition and after. There was also a smaller variant called the Wii Mini exclusively released in Canada that used a completely different plastic shell. Not only did it not play GameCube games, it also only had one USB port, it didn't support an SD card, and there was no online functionality. The Wiimote was also upgraded in 2009 with the Wii Motion Plus. Some games like The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword and Wii Sports Resort required this as it added more precise motion functionality. Every Wiimote made after this had this functionality baked in, but if you had an old model you could buy this little dongle attachment that added the functionality like you see in the video. And it does retain its compatibility with Wiimote accessories. Unfortunately, there was no way to play your DS games on your Wii, the dual screen probably attributing to that, but there were some combos of Wii and DS games that could wirelessly talk to one another. You could import Miis, Animal Crossing characters, Pokemon, things of that nature. And if you have a Wii that supports GameCube controllers, the GBA to GameCube adapter is supported. We're reaching the point where virtual libraries are becoming the norm. Nintendo's first eShop being introduced with the Wii. Like I said at the start of the video, it's not something we're going to heavily dive into, but just something I thought I'd lightly touch on, because at the time it really was a novel concept. Just to be able to emulate an old NES or N64 game on official hardware with official controllers, well, you'd be using the Wii Classic controller, if you were lucky. It was cool though, you didn't need a disc, you didn't need a cartridge, you just downloaded it. By today's standards, it's not a novel concept at all. But back then, for some people, this was the first time they were experiencing Ocarina of Time or Super Mario 64. I had a much more optimistic view on it back then. Today it's kind of turned into companies preying on their consumers nostalgia, but a topic for another time. The 3DS, the true generation sequel to the DS line. 
I remember being kind of done with the DS when this came out, but the gimmick of 3D without glasses, it was the ultimate FOMO. That wasn't something you could just go on YouTube and experience, you had to be there in front of a console itself. Not to mention that one of the launch titles was Ocarina of Time 3D. So I bought one, and like many others, I turned the 3D off after a couple days. It was a novel concept, and it did work. It just became a little distracting for me a couple hours in. But the last and most important reason I bought this? The 3DS line is completely backwards compatible with the entire DS library. And at the time, my OG DS was looking pretty rough. Not to mention that little analog nub? Yeah, it works with original DS games. Unfortunately, the 3DS is the first Nintendo handheld console that is completely region locked. This would also carry forward into the new 3DS. So be careful when browsing eBay. An XL model came out for the 3DS and a 2DS came out which removed the 3D function and the foldability. One last thing I want to touch on before we go to the Wii U. You might think that there'd be some compatibility between styluses and DS models, right? You would be wrong. Every single different model of DS, normal or XL, original 3DS, new 3DS, they all use different styluses. I kind of get it, you're making something that you gotta fit a lot of parts into and that stylus has to be, it has to accommodate for all that, you know, that stylus is taking up space inside because you're sliding it in. But wow, the, you know, the stars didn't align at least once? So I don't know, that, that was just something that totally shocked me in my research for this video. That is probably the most shocking thing thus far. Like, it's too much to be a coincidence. Like, Miyamoto had to have done that on purpose. My body, my body is ready. <laughs> ah yes, the Wii U, the DS in my living room that could have been. But actually, yes, a lot of people wanted this console to be compatible with DS games because you have your gamepad screen, your TV screen. It would have been nice to have a port on the Wii U to actually put in DS or 3DS games. Nintendo did, however, make a large handful of DS games available on the Wii U's virtual console. So somebody at Nintendo definitely saw this as a good idea. Maybe putting DS and 3DS hardware in the Wii U was too much to ask. Carrying the Wii name, the Wii U could do almost everything the Wii could in Wii mode. Except all the GameCube stuff. There's no GameCube memory card ports, there's no GameCube controller ports. There was an official GameCube controller adapter release for the Wii U, but this will only work for Wii U games like Smash 4, and not Wii games like Smash Bros Brawl. Some Wii U games will support Wii accessories, like the Pro Controller, the Nunchuck, the Sensor Bar, all that. But when your Wii U is in Wii mode, you're stuck with all your Wii stuff. So for example, you cannot use your Wii U Pro Controller on Mario Kart Wii or Hell's Kitchen, even if you really want to. The Wii U also introduced Amiibos. These work on a variety of games in a variety of different ways. The functionality is built into the Wii U, the new 3DS, and the Switch. The normal 3DS is not compatible with Amiibos out of the box. You need to buy this NFC reader separately. So we have our very last DS, possibly the last DS that'll ever be released, I don't know. The new 3DS. It's region locked like before, there's also an XL version of it, for some reason in Japan it's called the LL version. There is also a 2D variant, but it only comes in an XL version. The kicker is there's only 16 games that exclusively work for the new 3DS right now. So if you decide to buy one, you'll be happy to know that it is backwards compatible with 3DS games and DS games. So you won't be stuck just playing 16 games. And that's about it. It is a, it's a shame what the smartphone industry has done to the DS line. We have finally arrived at current day with the Nintendo Switch. There are currently two models, the normal Switch and the Switch OLED, both of which can share accessories like the dock, Joy-Cons, controllers, whatever. The Switch actually supports a variety of Bluetooth controllers, including the Wii U Pro Controller. It also supports that GameCube controller adapter from the Wii U. The Switch is also not region locked like the Wii, 3DS, and Wii U, and new 3DS are. Unfortunately, none of your Wii U or 3DS purchases will carry over into the Switch. You'll have to start from scratch. And we're done. Full Nintendo timeline beginning to end. I mean, I skipped stuff like the Virtual Boy and a lot of the smaller stuff. Again, go to the link in the description to the Google Sheets. That is where a more detailed chart view is going to be. Thank you very much for watching. I'm very grateful for all the traffic the channel's been getting recently. Feel free to check out the PlayStation compatibility video I did a few weeks ago. We'll be doing Xbox next. That is going to be much shorter. Feel free to like or dislike the video, hit subscribe. Don't forget to tip your waitresses and have a great night.